Good afternoon. Welcome to the Ottawa Folk Festival. Number 19. And this is the 19th time I've stood up here and sung O Canada. I just think that what Arthur's done is invaluable to the city, to the music community, and to the country. I always describe him as a hippie first. I always do. It's, I feel, I feel, I mean, you won't necessarily know that when you see him, but I think that it's like a deep and important part. So I'm like, my dad's, my dad's an old hippie folk musician. Well, I was born in Scotland, but a stone's throw away from David Francie's uh, birthplace in Ayrshire. I moved to Sarnia and uh, lived in Sarnia until I was about 13. And then we moved to Europe and lived in Paris and Strasbourg for four or five years. My father was a mechanical engineer with a company called Polymer in Sarnia, uh, made rubber. I came to Ottawa to uh, do journalism. I, I got into the journalism course. But within three months of being in Ottawa, I started Rooster's Coffee House and, uh, because there was the music in the story. It was in like a stairwell that he, he uh, curtained off. You got it moved to a much bigger room. I ran Roosters for three years. Ian Tamblin uh, was a, a regular at Roosters Coffee House. Arthur was really the first guy to give me a, a break. One of the, the neat things about those days was that was when you would hire an act for three or four nights in a row. And it allowed acts to, to build a following. He was cheap, but it was a, a gig. I was actually fired from Roosters, uh, primarily because of the alcohol situation. Uh, I refused to sell draft beer. I drove cab for a couple of years, which uh, was the, the job of all folk musicians at the time. He ran a couple of bars in uh, the market. It was called the Capitol Tavern downstairs, and men's toilet was a concrete trough. Uh, fights every Friday night. But upstairs was this folk club called The Nozzle that uh, I booked and ran. Well, he was brave. I, I would love to say that I had a five-year business plan, but <laughs> I had a five-minute business plan. I borrowed $5,000 from my father and uh, found a building that uh, wasn't going to fall down right away, that had a couple of rooms that I could use for studios. Definitely had this look of getting ready to fold in on you at any minute and there were animals and kids and people and tons of instruments. It was on Bronson Street and it was small. Uh, it was in uh, what I would call a um, demilitarized zone. Bronson Street was, was a place where commercial enterprises sort of sprouted and died. Now I started off with a little piece from Wood Smoke and Oranges by Ian Tamlin because it's real Canadian. But he also did something that was was um, particularly tender. He, he took that song and he had commissioned someone to put it on the wall of the Ottawa Folklore Centre, on the south wall. And it was an honour to have that done, but it was also a tremendous honour in a way to watch it fade. Land of the silver birch, cry of the loon something about this country that's a part of me and you. All the folklore centers from Victoria to Halifax, they must teach, they must have recordings, must have a repair department, must be uh, the center of the folk music community. I like that the word center is in the name because I think that that's what it has become. It's a clearinghouse, it is a bulletin, bulletin board, it is a meeting place. To put the word center in it, it's gotta be more than just a store. The other part is giving employment to musicians. Uh, he was my boss, he was a bit of a hard ass sometimes, but he employed me and he allowed me, and he did this for so many musicians, he allowed us to kind of have our own schedule so that we could go and play music. You know, the energy is very different here because we're all right-brained people, you know. We all think uh, in, a, in a way that you're not usually going to encounter. Well, I was married at the time to a woman named Terry Penner. She ran the school and she was a bookkeeper. Arthur was the front guy, you know, and, uh, you know, sort of the Scottish uh, factor. One of the magic things that they, that they both believed 
that Arthur always still maintains is that everybody has a right to play music. Lot of community events because that's one of Arthur's dreams is you know we're gonna have a community choir it's open to everybody and we give back to the community I discovered pub caroling the group that I led I was teaching them the carols and we were singing them in a pub and um, it was very nice, but it wasn't, uh, I, it wasn't helping me out financially at all. I came to the Folklore Center and mentioned this activity to Arthur and to Terry. And without any hesitation at all, they said, we'll, we'll sponsor you doing that. You will pay me to do that. Well, sure. An artist gets paid for his work. Terry was sick for a long time. And the two of them just had tremendous strength getting through that. I mean, we were a real, it was uh, a two-person operation at the time. I was a person out front selling, buying, uh, uh, you know, had the vision kind of thing. And Terry was the anchor that uh, uh, held the whole place in, in uh, to some sense of reality, you know, financially and uh, teaching-wise. So it was uh, a big blow when, when Terry died. Her wake that we held, it started off at the Bank Street location of the Folklore Center, um, and everybody uh, brought noisemakers and drums and percussion instruments, and we had a big parade all the way down Bank Street, just making noise and hollering. Like a really, a really joyous, celebratory, community-oriented moment. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, you know, for Dad coming to that moment and suddenly being the solo parent of two kids, Having that community there to bolster us up was really um, indispensable. You know, part of believing in community is also believing in neighborhoods. Turning you know, the street outside of the Folklore Center into itself a destination, I think was a way of just spreading the energy and the passion and the identity of the Folklore Center more broadly into the neighborhood as a whole. You know, when I won the Juno, it's gonna make me cry. Um, it, it was during this, this store, when we were in the big store, and um, Arthur put a huge banner out in front of the store congratulating me. And um, my parents went and took a picture of it. They were so proud. And, and I think that that was really the loveliest thing. He's found performing with uh, Wendy, his, his wife, to be a bigger joy than being a storekeeper. Celtic Rascalian show is essentially a piece of musical theater. It's an education, classical, and folk music show. Working with folk musicians, uh, as my sidemen, they play guitar, do the lead vocals, and I organize all the shows and do the rest of it. And I actually had him audition. <laughs> nah, really? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I bet he uh, aced it. I love the Rascalians because I think that's when you see Dad um, really sort of being the uh, giant ham that he is. The most enjoyable thing in the world is when a seven-year-old comes up to me after the show and says, Arthur, you're so funny. When a lot of people think about what Dad has done, they don't necessarily think of him as, you know, a businessman. They think of him as a community leader, as somebody who created the space for a community to come together. Let the music begin. <laughs>